public. Okay, welcome to the Spine Conference. Today's discussion will be bone morphogenic protein and spinal fusions. And um, the thing on the bottom right there is not a strand of Christmas lights. It is bone morphogenic protein. It's the protein. So that's exciting, right, Katie? Very. <laughs> okay, so this is a 84-year-old um, woman um, who presented in July of 2017. And uh, I'm using this case as a, as a segue. Hey, good morning, Paul. Good morning. I'm using this case as a segue to bone morphogenic protein. 84-year-old uh, woman who came, presented in 2017 with low back pain and sciatica. She said she's had years of pain, and uh, she's been to multiple surgeons, and she keeps saying, they keep telling her she's not an operative candidate due to the complexity of the surgery and her age. Um, she's relatively healthy. She had a nephrectomy in 96, and they removed all the cancer with good margins, high blood pressure. She lives alone in assistant living. She's 5'5", five 112 pounds, and she's very um, intelligent, very nice. But uh, she's a frail woman. You can just tell. You can just tell she's very thin. She's very frail. So, um, who's who's out there in outer space? To tell me what's on the X-rays. Uh, Brian McCormick and Grant Hood are usually together. Yeah, about Brian. Brian's smart. Brian, are you out there? Good morning, Doctor Antonides. Hey, good morning. Um, so so I'm looking at an AP and a lateral of the L spine uh, in an elderly female, um, showing multi-level degenerative disease, um, most significantly affecting, let's see, uh, like L1, L2 uh, has significant loss of uh, disc space. Um, there's significant uh, scoliosis. Um, um, I'm not sure how to describe it, but it, I'm not sure what like retroesthesis, anteroesthesis is in the coronal plane, but the scoliosis is so bad that the vertebrae, vertebrae kind of slipped off of each other, L, L1 over L2. Um, yeah, I think, you're, I, I think right. you, mean, you mean, hold on, you mean L3, L4. So I, I call it la lateral listhesis. What do you call it, uh, Dr. Sexton? Okay, lateral listhesis. So it's important for you to, that's, so that's very good. It's a very good thing. Yeah, lateral listhesis at 3, 4. Pretty significant, right? Almost yes. important. Okay. Do you want to add anything else, Dr. Sexton, since you're here? No. Okay. Okay. So um, now this is an MRI that she had eight months prior to me seeing her. And um, I, don't, I didn't find this very um, helpful, but I want to ask, I want to ask Dr. Sexton something, because I don't know, I want to understand this. On the parasagittal cut, if you see at 3-4, this black thing, I think, is ligamentum flavum, right? Yeah, I do. And this, this, this is another structure. And in the middle, it looks it's bright. It's either what fat or water or something, exactly. maybe. Exactly. Okay. Hold. I want to show you one more thing. So then, at L three L four, is that what I'm seeing here? Yeah, that's uh, your analysis that the bright on T two is either fat or or water. The way we could conclusively differentiated if, if the question arose would be the fat sat, the, the stir sequence, which turns fat black and leaves water bright. Uh, but in this case, because we know the anatomy, uh, and we know that, uh, well, we know the anatomy that it's going to be epidural fat. Okay. It's bright on T2, but it's not fat saturated. Okay, so I want to ask Paul Zdurian, because he knows everything. Why is there all that fat there, Paul? Like, why? Why isn't there fat at 4-5? What? A little bit, not as much. But almost half of the available spinal canal is fat. Do you have an answer? I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, it's a common finding. I mean, we always see it. I mean, no matter how much stenosis there is, there's usually some fat that's posterior at the upper levels uh, because of the triangular shape of the canal. You see it two, three, you see it one, two. And I think uh, when we get in there, we often will just, you'll find little fatty area there it's just but sometimes more than others right well sometimes you could have abnormal fats you know um but in a really heavy person but She's even thin. in a thin patient i think you also will see a little bit of yeah. fat there i yeah. think what happens is, is as as the as the, the facets get more stenotic the fat that's there gets kind of pushed more towards the middle and maybe indents the fecal sac like you're seeing in those areas okay. 
um, believe that there is stenosis caused by fat. I mean, and you reference a lot of fat. Sometimes we just see a lot, and it's very narrow all the way. But in this particular patient, there's not fat everywhere, just intermittently. Uh, and the sac definitely looks uh, concave posteriorly. Okay, to your question, I, I think so. But probably, you know, if I saw if this person didn't have the deformity, didn't have the thesis, and say that 3 4 stenosis that we see there with the epidural fat was the worst level, you know, like, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But sometimes you, you see the caudic line that just plastered mm -hmm. against the ventral structures uh, with a tremendous amount of mycomatosis, and I'll typically be depressed as. And it's very impressive because it's it's almost like a like an overstuffed suitcase, you know, where you you push the uh, sit on the lid to to close the suitcase. Once you get that lamina off, it expands to like three x or four x, where it really just sort of becomes much much thicker than what you appreciate on uh, on an axial cut like that with the lamina in place. Okay, so uh, next, who who's a uh, um... Got, probably got Grant on there. Grant, there, Ocean's there. Grant, you out there? Grant or Ocean? Thank you. Who's there? Like Grant. Thank you, Doug. Yes, okay. Grant, what do you think of the uh, axial? Uh, what do you think of the axial cuts now? And the question I have uh -huh. uh, before you before you explain the axial cuts, the question I have is, um, tell me about the canal at every single level. Tell me about the rotation, how you know it's rotated, and what's the normal spinal canal for a patient? So I'm going to start from the top. At T12 L1, um, pretty wide canal at that point, a lot of CSF around the cord. Um, no real significant disc bulges at um, either side. Going down to L1 L2, um, I see a little bit more stenosis. Uh, looks like it's coming from the facet joints at that level. Um, there's still room for the cord, however, it does appear very triangular. Hey, the cord's um, the hey, hey, the cord's gone. <laughs> Come on, Grant. Yeah. Come on, dude. The nerve roots. Yeah. The Call canal, the canal is triangular, the nerve roots are Cauda equina. Cauda equina. Cauda equina, still plenty of room. Okay. At L2, L3, you start to see that rotation. Um, Still see a decent amount of CSF there for the cauda. Um, there's a disc, uh, it's rotated, but I think there's also a disc protrusion on the left side. Um, looks like at the foramenal level, uh, which may be compressing. Um, this? Other side. This? Other side. This? Right there, yes. Yeah, yes. Maybe. Okay, what about three, four? Three, four, it looks like that rotation actually comes back a little. Um, again, I think there's bilateral for set joint hypertrophy there, causing a little bit of um, foramenal stenosis bilaterally. The, also, the canal appears very triangular. Um, so probably some element of spinal stenosis at that level. Um, if the, L4, L5. Hey, if the stenosis at L3, L4 cannot be explained by ligamentum flavorum or bulging discs. What else could be explained by, because you have knowledge of the x-ray at 3-4. So you have knowledge of the x-ray. And, oh. and so 3-4, if you can't explain the stenosis by just ligamentum flavorum and bulging discs, what else could the stenosis be from? It could be from... Um... Look at 3-4. If you have two toilet paper rolls and a wire between it, and you shift the toilet paper rolls, what happens to the wire? Sure. <laughs> it's a vanilla thesis, don't you think? Yes, it could be. Okay. Okay, let's keep going. So the patient came back. Uh, now this is uh, eight months later, and. Um, the stenosis is a bit worse, and I'm asking uh, Grant, why are the nerve roots clumped on one side? Why? The reason that was thesis. 
Uh, well, probably, probably from the scoliosis. But anyway, so we'll just keep going. The stenosis at 2, 3, and uh, 3, 4, it's more severe now. And uh, I don't want to belabor this point because I want to talk about BMP. So the problem list is um, an 80-year-old, ask Brian because he's the chief, 80-year-old woman, severe stenosis at 2, 3, 3, 4, lysesis at 3, 4, the apex curves at 2, 3. She cannot walk. She feels she doesn't want to live with this. And she has a scoliosis. So, uh, you sir, you have yeah. Before we get to this, let me make a comment, old school. A patient like this, I think when you're considering doing surgery, the question is, is there a, a small operation you can do to fix this or a large operation? And I think I would do potentially a myelogram CT. I think myelograms, when you have listhesis and scoliosis and are done when they're weight-bearing, can be valuable in showing you exactly the degree of stenosis. And there's one level that there's a block at, for example, you might want to consider just treating that one level. So I think, you know, we don't do myelograms enough, as much we used to, bless you. But I think that it can be valuable in a case like this to really define the the anatomy when a patient is standing. That's when a mile, how the myelogram is done. So I would consider doing a myelo CT if I was going to tackle a patient of this age uh, to really get a better understanding of, of what, how severe the stenosis is and whether there's a lesser procedure that would match the clinical symptoms. Any comments from guys? Paul? What about you, Dr. Mack? Yeah, I, I go, I'm glad to hear you guys do that because I do a lot of uh, CT myelograms, especially if there's previous instrumentation. It's just uh, difficult for the MRI to differentiate that. But the question I have for you is, you can fix this pretty well indirectly with multi-level X lifts. You know, you, you'd argue about which, which levels to do and you match them with her, her symptoms, but you could use a relatively small incision and put X lifts at two, three, three, four. I think three, four is the worst level. And then you gauge from that based on perhaps spinal cord monitoring and the fact you could do a couple levels, not lose any blood, and you have good exposure. So you could do through maybe a three or four inch incision, uh, L1, two, two, three, three, four, and even four, five. So is that a more minimally invasive approach than going posteriorily in an 80 year old, decompressing the whole thing? You can directly visualize the nerves, follow them out through the neural foramen. You probably concentrate on the concave side, but then you're going to put in instrumentation. So I think uh, I'd be surprised. I want to hear from Mesfin, but I'd be surprised if you could do that MIS, you know, and, and have less. Let me understand X lift first and then posterior? No, I'm saying maybe just, just do the X lift alone. And see how they do. I uh, just think about that. Um, because I, I do think that's more minimally invasive than, I don't know where to shorten up the posterior procedure. If, if she had like knee pain, I had a patient yesterday, all knee pain, so it's an L3, L4 area. So then you could just do a, well, what I did was a, a, a T lift at 3, 4. But I don't think that's good enough for her. She's got too much stenosis. So we, we that, I mean, that's what this, to me, this whole, um, discussion is about is how you can shorten things up the way Paul talked about it. How can you do this, you know, less than a L2 to L5 decompression fusion and instrumentation? If you could get away with something from the front with x -Lip, I think that is easier on somebody. Uh, Mr. Uh, do we have a uh, pre-op bone density test? Understanding it's going to be artificial. It's, I'll tell you right now, it's weak. If you look at her, you know she's osteoporotic. She's, she doesn't run marathons or lift weights. So she says. That's sews. okay. At least she's not on steroids or anticoagulated. True, true. And, and she's not sick. She's not rheumatoid. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a plus. And, and what do you think her symptomatic level is? I think it's 2334. I think it's 2334, central stenosis. Looking at the radiographs. You could justify a T-pen pelvis, and obviously that's not something you're going to recommend for this particular patient. Okay, so that's one option. I, I think that uh, what Paul McAfee said is is reasonable. I'd be a little worried about doing a standalone uh, 
uh, X lift, and I'd probably perk from the back. But um, my preference would be to go from the back because I think I could get uh, a better decompression along the lateral recess and take out the whole pars on the affected side. Is it bilateral stenosis or unilateral? Bilateral. Here's a spinal canal. I mean, there's a. But, but both legs bother? Yes. Yeah. So, by, so. I would do a short segment from two to four and uh, do really wide aggressive facetectomy, take the pars down, see what I can do in terms of trying to derotate her. Not sure how much she's going to move, especially down at the lucesis level. I'd be aware of with, uh, with losing fixation uh, with, the, with the screws. So I'd, I'd be okay choosing her in situ if I needed to. But if I could derotate her a little bit, give her a little bit of lithosis, get rid of the lateral lucesis a bit more. Um, I'll try to do that in trough, but otherwise the focus will be wide facetectomies. It all the ligaments about wide aggressive um, pars take down to follow the nerve loops out. Okay, so um, I did n nothing what anybody said. What I did was a uh, <laughs> unilateral laminotomy, bilateral decompression. This is from an article in China where just through a small hole, you decompress the ipsilateral side tilt the table, decompress the other side. I personally don't think you can get the far root in this approach. I think it's too dangerous. Uh, and then an inside your fusion on just one side. So basically, I did a porthole, a hole in the spine here, a hole in the spine here, decompress the spinal canal bilaterally, and just inserted BMP in the posterior lateral gutter. So um, I've done this 30 times, and I'm putting them together. Uh, I've had excellent results. But that's not the point of this discussion. But I, I want to talk about BMP because I did use a BMP. And you can see the BMP in the posterior lateral gutter here. So that's two weeks post-op. Here's two months post-op. Patient was doing extremely well. And this is three years post-op. And uh, I just saw her in, in October, and she's uh, extremely happy. Katie, you saw her with me, right? She's, um, I'm trying to think of she's extremely happy. Yeah. She walks 30 minutes a day. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Extremely happy. She walks 30 minutes a day, and she recently ref referred a friend, and she doesn't even talk about her spine anymore. She goes, I, I, what, what's my problem? And you can see here the posterior lateral fusion uh, of the transverse processes and facets. And you can see here's a media post-op, uh, two months, and three years. So I basically used bone morphogenic protein in the posterior lateral gutter. Does anyone make any comments or questions? I'm going to keep talking about BMP. Yeah, and I'm not as magnificent. They're, they teach that in um, St. Louis. There's a neurosurgeon there that, that does this, and you know, you, you can it'll take you through it when you work on a cadaver. I thought it was difficult how you retract the dura in a stenotic canal. I don't, then, I don't retract it. Well, no, he does. So you like with a pen field, and then he has a burr to burr off the inferior part or the the deep part of the lamina and gets to the opposite root. You don't, you don't have to. You don't have to. Well, uh, that's good. I mean, to that's know, how that's how I, this person I, does it, but I, I, I don't. Well, that's good. Um, but, but the patient did have bilateral symptoms. The patient had a great result. Tell us how you prevented the, wherever the hematoma goes, the BMP is going to go. So how did you prevent that from following your hematoma in the canal? I, I did it. I just put it. I put it in the posterior lateral gutter. And uh, I hope that the BMP doesn't go in the spinal canal, but that is a complication. We had assessed the item, you know, at the time. Um, it's not reported anywhere because Med you're not allowed to, but Medtronic did a, a prospective study to try to get um, infuse in as a T-lip, and they just stopped the study because they had such a high incidence. We're going to go over that. Ossifying in the canal. We're going to go over that. Yeah, so it kind of bothered me at the time. They, you know, people, so people were doing it on their own and they didn't know that there's a potential problem because they're not going to publish like adverse events. We're going to go over every adverse event. Yeah. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so, well, I, so in the back of my mind, I never got into this because I couldn't figure out a safe way of doing it for sure. Well, it's supposed to stay on the, we're supposed to stay on the collagen sponge and you're supposed to not squeeze the sponge so that the fluid doesn't leave the collagen sponge. I've never seen it. Uh, I've never seen it go into the spinal canal from the posterior lateral gutter. But I've seen many, many other complications. I'm going to show them to you. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, a, that's a great result. Uh, I'm 
<coughs> might be getting to it, but uh, what do you what do you wrap in this font? Can you tell us kind of what you do? What I, you I use Mastergraft. <laughs> 20 cc's Mastergraft hydroxyapatite, calcium hydroxyapatite. So um, that's what you see on the X-ray. So we'll talk about the bone graft, iliac crest, local allograft, bone morphogenic protein, demineralized bone matrix. Uh, so the classic is iliac crest, which we all which we all know. And uh, what are the four? Ocean, can you tell me the four things you need to get a bone to heal? Or you need stability, blood supply, um, and then. Uh, Osteo, well, it's right there, kind of, right there. Just read it. Osteogenesis, <laughs> induction, uh, induction, induction, uh, genesis, and then mechanical stability. Okay, so we, so the, the, oxy, the scaffold can come from allograft. So in 1965, uh, Uris found that um, demineralized, lyophilized segments of bone, so you take all the calcium out of bone, stick it into muscle, and it can, it can make a bone formation. That was 1965. So what's BMP? It's a transforming growth factor, um, which can do all sorts of things. And this is a, a list from another lecture that I took from the internet of all the things that bone morphogenic protein can do. So it's not just for bone. It, it does all sorts of things in the development of cells, which is you know, quite incredible. So when O2, the Infuse came out with Medtronic, and it was used for uh, L4S1 ALIF, using the lumbar tapered cage through an anterior approach. And then 03, Stryker Biotech um, was FDA approved. And in 2015, BMP was improved for uh, um, uh, oblique lateral interbody fusions. In 04, um, FDA approved it for open tibia fractures. So, so BMP worked incredible. It came out in 02. I mean, and we used it, I used it all the time. And it worked. I mean, it worked. And then by 07, 50% of A-lifts, 40% of PLIFs, and 30% of posterior lateral gutter fusions, people were using BMP. I mean, it was the rage. Um, sales were, for Medtronic, all spinal sales were $3.5 billion in 2010. And um, they, they made $700 million from um, uh, Infuse that year. Now, I, I read the entire annual report from 2020. Med, Med, Medtronic does not break out sales of Infuse, which is kind of interesting. Well, they said they were making $2 million a day at the, at the, at the height of it. That's like at the height, but not, yeah, how about now? Right. Now it's not. No, 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 at that time. At that time. We, we had spine fellows. We had two guys from Long Island Jewish, and every single case in their residency, they used a large um, BMP on each side, on each side of the spine. Okay. So what, what uh, but there were, there were problems. So these are all the complications that you can get from bone morphogenic protein. We're gonna go a lot of them. So interestingly, uh, the Wall Street Journal had an article in 2010 um, uh, stating that um, th there were basically um, complications with uh, Amplify which was uh, a very high dose of BMP that Medtronic was trying to bring to market. And uh, it was linked to cancer. In fact, it never made it to the market. And I remember we had a dinner uh, with, I'm not gonna say who it was, a very intimate dinner. And uh, he was like, the, I felt <laughs> one of the best spine surgeons in the country. And he said with a, with a straight face, you have to use 40 milligrams of BMP at each level to get it to fuse. And we looked at each other and said, are you serious? Like, what? That's crazy, because we knew the complications that regular uh, infuse had. We, I could not even imagine what 40 milligrams would do. Um, so then in 2011, uh, because of all the complications, the Senate Finance Committee wrote a letter to the CEO of Medtronic stating they want all the data. And as a result of all these investigations, um, this is from the Wall Street Journal article. They retracted publications, uncovered inappropriate financial ties, possible fraud, research misconduct. And then in 2011, Kerrigy printed this, uh, published this article about all the complications that BMP had uh, in the Spine Journal. Uh, and just to summarize, um, that the previous articles underreported complications by 10 to 50 times. Um, and uh, they had multiple complications. 
So there are also financial conflicts of interest. I won't get into the details, but you can dig and find them if you're interested. And it's in the, it, it has these conflicts of interest. The money that was paid had seven zeros behind it. So um, there are multiple articles about the complications. These are just two from 2010 which I think the bottom one people, should, the residents should read. Um, I'm going to get into them. But this was the best one article I found, and I sent it to everybody, tissue engineering, because I, I felt this was really unbiased. It wasn't written by an orthopedic surgeon. So these are, these are all the problems, not all of them, but many of them, cost. It's like $5,000 a case, ballpark, right? Uh, swelling, a big, uh, uh, incredible swelling. So this is um, an ACDF where we, uh, it was common to insert the BMP into the allograft that you insert into the front of the neck. And it will cause a tremendous infl inflammatory response and swelling in the neck. And I recall when I was doing this, one of my partners told me, like, we admitted one of our patients to the ICU because of neck swelling from BMP. I said, what? This was, this was like, way before anything was published, like 2004, 2003. And we, we both of us said, well, we're not using this anymore. We got to figure this out. And then it, it turned out that this did happen, like common. In fact, it was first reported in uh, 2006. And then in 2008, the FDA uh, uh, basically stated um, uh, a warning, an off-label warning for the use of anterior approaches. Um, does anybody have any comments about that? Yeah, I'll tell you, because um, there are three papers in a row at Cervical Spine Research Society that talked about the complications. And I, you know, Tom Zedevlik was a fellow of mine. I think he's an honest guy that was involved with this. But Scott Bowden, I think, uh, is incredibly honest. But he, was, he said that um, they should have known that, you know, Medtronic said that you're only supposed to use, like, a third or a fourth of the small... Um, size. You're not supposed to use a large size. Like 0.5, 0 0.5 cc's. Yeah. So, so the whole point is, these the guys on the inside that did the research for Medtronic knew a little more than everybody else. But, um, the, but, but the company wouldn't let them teach on it. So, fortunately, I, I never used it. I'm very, very sparingly um, used any BMP and. Think about Eugene Carragy, there's politics behind that too. So he was the editor of the journal and the entire issue was called The Year of Living Dangerously. So I think he, he tried to get the pendulum to swing the other way and he had a really high incidence of retrograde ejaculation that you're probably gonna go into. Yeah. But what, what killed me is if you look at their studies, they looked at, that. let's say they had five cases out of 100, they reported it is 5%, but 100 cases, there half of them were women, and women don't get retrograde ejaculation. So it was their way to double the incidence if they wanted to bring out a negative uh, issue. So, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I think it's a good product, and it will increase your fusion rate, but, man, we, I probably use it, like, less than five cases a year. But, but I think Larry Lanky uses it a lot more He's do, and I bet you Kabesh does too. There is a place for it, but it's one of those things you have to sort out by talking to people. You're not going to find out by looking in the literature because it wasn't the most up-to-date information. What, what do you think, Nesma? Well, I, I um, just to add on some of your comments, my thinking, especially with Manchur cervical, is you know, the fusion rates to begin with for a one or two level ACF is 95% plus. So what are we trying to improve on? You know, I, I think it's a very different situation if it's somebody with a failed posterior lumbar fusion, maybe they're immune compromised or diabetic or something else. You've uh, tried to get some crest or somebody has and that hasn't worked and then, well, BMP in that role, I think would have uh, a better fit. So I really try to I'm with uh, Paul McAfee. I use it very sparingly. I think I've used it once in the past two or three years. You're talking about all cases. All cases. Yeah, yeah never in the, Not never cervical. In the neck because the fusion rates, posterior cervical and anterior cervical, the fusion rates are so high now that 
I'm not sure, again, I'm not talking about historically, I mean today. Uh, I don't see any, any role for this in the, in the surplus spine at all. I see some role in failed fusions in the lumbar spine. Well, let's keep going some more complications. This is what uh, Dr. McAfee was explaining. When it's used as a T-lift, it can grow ectopic uh, bone formation, which can compress the neurological structures. You can see here, here, and also massive seromas. We can go over the seromas. This is a case of mine, 45-year-old woman who had an L405 fusion, presented a year later with a deep infection. So deep Let's inf say that again, a year later? A year post-op with a deep infection, one year post-op. And the literature states there's a three times increased delayed wound infection, 4% versus 1% uh, from the FDA data. And also the deep infection rate is five times what's normal, 2% um, versus a half percent. So this woman, a uh, patient of mine, was deep infection. And interestingly, I got a CT, which shows that 3-4 was solidly fused. Look at the facets at 3-4. I mean, solidly fused. And what I had done, I inserted the BMP into the 4-5 facet to get it to fuse. It, it, it leached out and fused the 3-4 facet, which was, I mean, this is kind of an amazing fusion. Uncontrolled bone formation, bone overgrowth. But it didn't go into the spinal canal. I'll show you another one, though. So uh, these are just different anterior approaches. And again, what Paul McAfee said, the ALIF retro, retrograde ejaculation, uh, from the testes, the sperm goes through and then into the prostate, and then instead of going out to create a baby, it goes into the bladder. And um, this is from Kerogy's uh, article in 2011, 7% versus a half percent for ALIFs. So postoperative seroma, they can compress the cervical spine. This is a case of mine. Uh, it was a revision posterior, so I felt I should use BMP. Again, this was in 07, 06. And this is, look at this massive seroma that he presented. Huge. So um, I basically just opened it at the bedside. The whole thing came out. But you can imagine, like, it's a, it's a terrific seroma. This was post-op day eight. And this is a 66-year-old woman, L405 fusion, post-op 18. And you can see the, this massive seroma from the BNP. <laughs> the literature from... 09 that I found was a 1%, but I think it's a lot higher than that. Yeah, that's the problem. You can't tell what the real percentage is from looking at the literature. That's the problem. I think it's higher. Another, so the other the thing that most concerns me is um, bone morphogenic protein is upregulated in diverse tumors and is associated with tumor cell proliferation, invasion, and at times poor clinical prognosis. So this is from the cancer research. And also, bone morphogenic protein, I mean, it's not just for bones. I mean, this is like a, this is a signaling protein. Um, it, it's been shown to have biological importance in bone metastases in both breast and cancer. So this hormone is used by cancer cells to metastasize and to spread and to grow. I mean, it's not just for bone formation. So this has been studied, and then the latest one I can find, this is from 2019, so, so there is basic science that th this, this hormone can accelerate cancer formation, but when you study patients, there's no evidence that it causes cancer. And the, and the latest one from 2019, uh, eight years, they studied these people eight years, 4,000 patients who had BMP from Washington State, and, the, and the, um, <laughs> the range was five years to 14 years. The rate of cancer was the same. Um, so um, does anybody have any comments or questions about that? So what, what is your policy? Is that who, who, what is people's policy about using bone morphogenic protein? Say, say if it's a man that has prostate cancer that they're watching, maybe would you use it then? What, what do people think? I personally would not. I, I would not. Yeah, somebody with uh, a known history of malignancy, I would not. The most common is breast, and, breast cancer and prostate cancer. Very, very common in the population, older population. So I think those two patients, those two subset of patients, I probably would not use it. A few comments uh, for the residents on the line and Brian here. You know, if, uh, if you see uh, on any of your in-training examinations or the boards, uh, BMP is one of the potential answers that's always the wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> 
just uh, okay. the, the, put a line through that one. It will never be the answer for for any test question. Uh, Good rule of thumb. <laughs> so I mean, I might be wrong in in, in sort of thinking like this, but I mean, can, cancer cancer and oncogenesis itself is like a multi-step process, including accumulation of multiple like multiple mutations along the way. So I guess like TGF beta being one of the common ones that can show up, I wouldn't be surprised that just a single hit doesn't necessarily increase your risk because you need an accumulation. But in someone who already has the pro like a, a, a tumor ongoing, I wouldn't want to give one more reason for it to go bad. The most common is breast cancer and prostate cancer. I mean, very common to yeah. see patients in their 60s, 70s, 80s. But I would be nervous to say like I'm going to give you an oncogenic like factor. With your already cancer. Well, also, the other thing to consider is that you know that today we have alternatives, things like Trinity, for example, that gives you mesenchymal cells, will give you all the growth factors you need, that so you don't have to use BMP. So, yeah, I'm more likely if I think I need something analogous to a BMP to use something like a Trinity um, bone supplementation. You know. Or. Trinity is not bone representative protein. They, they're, they're not. They're not. I mean, they will try to tell you it's a, it's similar. No, but I'm saying if you look at the, the it's, it's not certainly even close. It's better than allograft bone alone. It's better than the DBM that gives you mesenchymal cell. I'm just saying it's a it's a better alternative. All I'm saying is we have better alternatives now to consider as opposed to uh, BMP. And Messi, you've got a lot of experience with that. Right? What do you mean? You think you think uh, 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 Trinity works as well as bomophagenic protein in your clinical experience, Messvin? Anecdotally. Yeah, I don't need BMP, so I don't know what the results with uh, Trinity are very good. Yeah, I mean, but I think the the point that Paul is making is we're not comparing um, well the for the patient with prostate CA that needs let's say it's a failed fusion needs a, a redo. It's not, well, we're either going to use BMP or, sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. I think the point he's making is we have another alternative today that was not available 15 years ago, where you say, uh, uh, you know, we can use this product or we can take Iliac Quest or we can use Trinity. Bone marrow aspirates. I mean, yeah, things, so there are other things that we have that, that we can use that I think are good alternatives. Okay, let's keep let's keep moving. Um, this I, the residents should probably not read this, but how much bone morphogen protein do you use? And I don't think it's clear in this article. It wasn't clear. But what dosage do you use? And definitely, the higher the dosage, the higher the complication rate. So this is another interesting case seven, of mine. Seventy-seven year old woman with low back pain, buttock pain, <coughs> relatively healthy, two level spondylolisthesis pre-op. Her psoas was normal. So I know what you're saying. Why are you why are you even talking about the psoas? Here, pre-op psoas was normal. Post-op, I did the L405 fusion, used bone morphogenic protein. Post-op, she had uh, left groin pain, left thigh pain. So I ordered a CT to look at my screw placement, and the psoas. Look at the psoas on the left. Look at the psoas on the right. Is it calcified on the too? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's calcified. So basically, you can see here's the BMP, and here's the psoas. And the, here's the MRI. The myositis of the psoas. And it was, uh, it was, it was uh, published in 2008 as a complication. So here's another complication. 60-year-old woman... Post-op had sciatica. She was, uh, I think, a year out. Um, and then uh, she did well initially, but then had recurrent sciatica actually three years later. And I had a repeat MRI scan. I had inserted bone morphogenic protein in the facet. See, see him, that's been. And uh, I thought her stenosis was not coming from, uh, I thought her, her sciatica was coming from the 5-1 segment. But very interestingly, look at the 4-5 segment where I had inserted uh, bone morphogenic protein. I mean, it's really hypertrophic. Did you do a laminectomy there? No. No, I just did a laminotomy. So, oh, no, your laminotomy closed off, too. Yeah. But she, she actually she didn't require surgery. She got better with just non-operative. But, oh, but yeah. overgrowth of bone, yeah. So that's it for today. So any questions or comments on bone morphogenic protein? Well, yeah, are you using it now? When, when do you use it? Use it in high-risk cases for non-union. 
smokers, recalcitrant smokers. Uh, the patient cannot have a cancer history. Would you use it, use it in the neck, anterior cervical? Never. Although I know it's, uh, I, I had used it for some time, uh, 0 0.3 cc's I was using, but I don't do it anymore. Thanks, bro. Oh, thanks, thanks for coming. I used it, I, I, the last patient I used was a patient who had a, uh, in the case who had a sacral deficiency fracture, and I went down to the pelvis, just, and so I, I used it over the sacral deficiency fracture. I've got a patient who's got a 5 1 pseudoarthrosis with loose screws where it's had a full laminectomy, so there's very little bone area for bone, and and you know those scarred up that area. So I'm going to be using in the gutters there. I think and that's the best.